Sure. Easier. So, I don't see the slides yet. Yet. I think he does not. He has not shared the slides. I guess. Not yet. Okay. But uh, I. So I have it now. Yeah. Now we can see it. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Okay. Thank you very much. So is the fault and everything okay? Absolutely. Yes. Exactly. Oh, good. Good. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. <clears throat> So you have the same bookshelf in the background, Sudeshna? Yes, we are in the same room. Why are you giving it away, Stefan? We are sitting <laughs> together. <laughs> <laughs> Keep it. So we'll tell everyone we are sitting together and conducting this colloquium. Yes, one well, <laughs> <laughs> Exactly the same arrangement, but uh, it's mirror. Yeah. Somehow, even a lamp there. And also yeah, you don't stuff. have the lamp. Yeah. yeah. I don't know why you don't have your lamp. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> So how often do you manage to have a collection uh, once in a month, twice? Sorry, uh, TSS, what was your question? Uh, how often are you managing to have a collection speaker? We are having every, every Friday. Every Friday we have. Every Friday? Oh, good. Yeah. But soon it will be on Thursday. <laughs> yeah. After 22nd, yeah. we are moving it to Thursday because our head of the department has some problems on Fridays. So. Okay. Okay. So we are having all the known people now. Ajit Ji is here. So when I'm talking, Sudeshna, when yes. I'm talking, I generally don't see the chat box. So I will announce that I will uh, answer the questions towards the end. OK, sure. Yeah. I mean, generally, I can't I, do I also I don't look at the chat box. <laughs> chat box <laughs> because somehow that deflects my concentration. So right, right. Me I too. Know. I just never uh, look at that. Yeah. Never look at it. Yes, that's that's better. Answer the questions at the end. So my student is here, Shushmita. <clears throat> Hello. Hello. Hello, Shushmita. I think she joined. I don't see her. Oh, no. Yeah. Yeah, I see this. Yeah, I still need to, I mean, so I tried to finish the letter yesterday, but we have a printer problem at home mm -hmm. and I need at tomorrow morning. Today I was busy because there's a conference. So I gave a conference talk and <laughs> yeah.
Priyadarshi is here. Hi, Priyadarshi. Hi, Priyadarshi. Good morning. You woke up so early. Yeah, I was up I went back in Memphis. I'm not up here. <laughs> no, actually, he's in Virginia now. Oh, okay. So that makes sense. Well, closer to you, right? Yeah, closer to me. I, I would say about maybe three hours. Yeah, sure. <laughs> so, uh, Shumprita is here still on, so she will be speaking next week. Shumprita. Right, yeah. I to see you. Somehow I see the people later joining. And yeah, it's it's happening like that here also. I don't know why. I okay, see. so Moni, Monica is Monica. You woke up at seven a.m. Oh wow, that's great. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Monica. Monica, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Good, good, good. Okay, Ashish is also here. Oh, very good. Great, oh, Ashish. Now? Thank you for coming. So, TSS, Ashish is our head of the department, and he's here. Hello, this is Hello, Ashish. Somehow there seems to be a lag somewhere. I cannot hear Ashish at least. Maybe we wait for two <laughs> more minutes or so? Maybe two more minutes, yeah. Well, okay, sure. so. Yeah. <clears throat> to join. <laughs> One of the master students here is here. Tamokna is here. <laughs> Shamul is here, our PhD student. Good. You will give the introduction this time. So yes, I will give you and give any. Shall I, shall I start? Yeah, please. Okay, I mean, so welcome everyone uh, to our colloquium talk, and a, a special thanks to Professor T S S R K Rao for a, a, you know agreeing to talk at our colloquium. And uh, I'll just give a brief introduction of uh, Professor Rao. Most of you know, but still. Professor Rao was a professor at the Indian Statistical Institute, and he did his PhD from Indian Statistical Institute. His supervisor, Professor Ashok Kumar Roy, we share our supervisor. And Professor Rao was in ISI. He, he held several important administrative positions there. And uh, he also is a fellow of the Indian Academy of Sciences. He's the recipient of Fulbright Nehru Academic and Professional Excellence Fellowship 2015 to 2016, Fulbright Nehru uh, Research Fellowship 2011 20 to 2012. And he was a senior research fellow at Institute of Advanced Studies in University of Bologna. He's traveled all over the world and uh, has, um, you know, he has co authored with mathematicians from all over the world. So you know, without further ado, I just pass the baton to Professor Rao. TSS, please start. Thank you for okay. <laughs> And uh, the nice uh, introduction. You should also say go ahead with uh, Sudesh now. So <laughs> that's uh, another thing. So let me uh, put my uh, slide on, which has my introduction in it, my abstract in it. So this is about uh, Birkhoff James uh, orthogonality, and um, this is one of the very successful extensions of uh, the notion of orthogonality on a Hilbert space, which most of you, including those uh, who are just doing their masters, have already seen. And um, the challenging problem is to understand this in um, concrete Banach spaces. Somehow, um, Hilbert spaces are nice, but um, the minute you want to do something uh, different from uh, uh, in a product structure, then you must necessarily encounter uh, Banach spaces. 
and I keep uh, telling my friends who work on uh, Hilbert Space Theory that your uh, most important source, namely the space of all operators on a Hilbert space, is a Banach space. It does not have a Hilbert space structure, and you must necessarily reconcile yourself to knowing a lot of Banach space theory um, to make substantial progress on these problems. So that is what uh, my interests are. I'm interested in the, one of my interests is to understand the notion of orthogonality in the context of uh, operators on Banach spaces, not only operators on Hilbert spaces, but uh, operators on Banach spaces. And um, the motivation for this comes uh, from a uh, very, not very popular work of uh, one of my former colleagues, Rajendra Bhatia, and a well-known uh, analyst, uh, Peter Semrel. They have um, uh, interpreted um, orthogonality of uh, individual operators on um, Hilbert space of finite dimension. And um, then uh, this thing has really took off. Several people tried to give uh, extensions of uh, the Bhatia Sembral result. And um, my interest is to derive this result in the context of uh, Banach spaces and on operators that are uh, what is called Wilcock James Abdhagen to a class of operators, not just between two operators, between one operator on one hand, the other hand, I have a class of operators. So that is uh, the problem that I'm looking at. And uh, it turns out that uh, this is uh, linked to a hard uh, minimax problem in uh, convex opti optimization theory. In fact, uh, I think along with the colloquium, we also received a copy of my paper um, from where these uh, results are based on. And uh, this paper is in uh, numerical function analysis and uh, optimization. And I'm hoping that this will appear in the October issue of this uh, journal. It's appeared online some time ago, but uh, probably a journal issue will come out uh, next month. So I partially solve this problem here. And of course, uh, my techniques uh, come from geometry of uh, Banach spaces. So we take, uh, start with a real Banach space X. And let's take uh, non-zero vectors X and Y. And I would say that uh, X is orthogonal to Y. I won't put any substitutes because we are going to talk about big of games orthogonality towards this uh, talk. So I will not add BS or any such thing at the subscript level to my orthogonality. So this is um, X is orthogonal to Y in the sense of big of and games. If uh, for all, again, real Banach space, so for all real scalars lambda, if you look at uh, the length of the vector uh, norm of x plus lambda y, that should be bigger than or equal to norm of x for all real scalars lambda. So if you look at uh, this uh, norm equation, it's very clear immediately that uh, this is not going to be a symmetric equation because we are talking about x plus lambda y being bigger than or equal to norm of x. So x is orthogonal to y and y is orthogonal to x are two different notions. The other thing you would notice is that of course if x is orthogonal to y, then x is orthogonal to any scalar multiple of y because this should happen for all real lambda. So I could also say that x is orthogonal to a scalar multiple of y. So that means x is orthogonal to the vector space spanned by the singleton y. So it is orthogonal to lambda of y for all lambda. So that means x is orthogonal to all the vectors in the vector space spanned by y. Now, if you look at the same equation, same quantities, length function in Hilbert spaces, and then use the inner product it's a very simple exercise to see that this would automatically happen in Hilbert spaces. If x is orthogonal to y in the sense of the inner product being zero, now look at this norm of x plus lambda y in the Hilbert space and square it and equate it to the inner product of the vector with itself and we would immediately say that this is bigger than or equal to norm of x. So in other words, this 
motion coincides with the usual motion that uh, inner product between the vectors is zero in the case of an Hilbert spaces. But in general, this is a different motion and it's not given by an inner product kind of a setup. So as I was uh, announcing a little while ago, I am not uh, really keeping uh, track of the comments box. So I'll come back to you in the middle or towards the end and uh, then answer any questions or comments. Is that okay? Is everybody here with me? Yes, we are. Okay. So this is the space or I, something? No, I'm, I just wanted to check back in case I log back. Okay. <laughs> okay. All right. So I, mean, I hope the space is all right for the students. So we will do this. So let's go back to my slides. So this notion, as I said, coincides with the usual notion of form or that analogy in case of Hilbert spaces. And unlike the case of Hilbert spaces, this orthogonality is not uh, symmetric or transitive. And um, in several interesting special cases, particularly when look, X is called a smooth Banach space, that means uh, there are unique uh, non preserving extensions in the on Banach theorem. So when X happens to be a smooth Banach space, then it does lead to geometric properties that are uh, similar to those uh, enjoyed in a Hilbert space. So even though if you don't have a Hilbert space, this uh, norm does behave a little more uh, better way when you assume additional geometric properties like uh, smoothness of the Banach space. For example, then orthogonality will actually become transitive. So let me start by giving them some uh, familiar examples. So consider um, an infinite dimensional Banach space and look at the space of all um, bounded operators on X and consider K of X as the space of all compact operators. Then this is a closed subspace of L of X. So you can talk about the quotient space L of X by K of X that has a name. It's called the Kalkin algebra. Now you take uh, the identity operator in L of X and then take the coset representing the identity operator in this quotient space. Well, this is a Banach algebra. And uh, most of you have seen that uh, the identity element in the Banach algebra has norm 1. So, 1 is equal to, of course, norm of the identity operator as an operator, which is also the same as the norm in the quotient space, which is distance between identity and the compact operators. So, the simple thing that you all know from Banach algebra theory that the identity in a Banach algebra is a vector of norm 1 would automatically tell you that uh, the distance between now uh, identity and the compact operators. Notice that I have taken X to be a finite dimensional. So identity is not in the space of compact operators. It's a strictly positive quantity. And we showed that uh, this is equal to 1. But that means if I take any lambda, since this is the infimum, this is less than or equal to I plus lambda times T for any compact operator T and for any scalar lambda. So we have to that I plus lambda of T is bigger than or equal to norm of I for all scalars lambda. So in my notation then, I is orthogonal to the compact operator T. And it happens for all compact operators. So I would say right now as I is orthogonal to compact operators on X. So this is a, one of the ways where you don't really recognize Mirkov uh, games or diagonality is occurring, but you will see this. And uh, since I have uh, students in my audience, you could immediately see this is nothing special. You could have taken a algebra with the uh, identity in the space of L of X, and you have taken in space of K of X, you could have taken a closed two sided ideal, 
proper close to side ideal then the quotient space is a quotient algebra and instead of identity you replace it by the vector e then one is equal to norm of e is same as distance between the identity and the ideal so that means that uh, the identity is always because James are the other two the proper closed two sided ideal for all elements of the proper closed two sided ideal so this is a uh, one application from uh, simple algebra that uh, manak algebra that you learn in your first course in functional analysis so let's look at um, another uh, example so most of us are uh, very familiar with uh, continuous functions on 0 1 has a banach space equipped with the supremum norm then there is a very well known and famous equation called uh, the dagobi equation which says that uh, for any scalar lambda if you look at lambda times identity operator on this banach space plus a compact operator that is exactly equal to absolute value of lambda plus norm of t so that is called the dagobi equation he discovered this property for compact operators on c0 on and so immediately this is bigger than or equal to norm of t so we have proved that if you have any compact operator it's always orthogonal in the sense of bicot james to all the vectors in the span of the identity operator so the famous uh, dagobi equation can also be interpreted as a uh, this kind of a statement and uh, again this has uh, led to a lot of uh, important research in banach space theory continues to be a very important problem to solve about what kind of operators on a general banach space would satisfy the equation namely norm of uh, lambda i plus identity t norm of lambda i plus t is equal to mod lambda plus norm of t so that is some uh, thing originated by dagobi and uh, continues to be a uh, problem of interest in banach space theory so i'll go back uh, to my slides so i'd like to send by the real banach spaces now i want to look at uh, l of x y the space of all uh, the linear operators between x and y and uh, we equip it with the usual norm norm of t is equal to supremum of uh, norm of t of x where x runs over the unit ball so for me somehow the subscript one stands for uh, the unit ball of the space so that is norm of t and uh, we are interested in understanding the uh, operators t and s between x and y you look at the cop games of the identity of the operators t t or the identity to s how is it related to or is it any relation at all to the notion of orthogonality for some reason you expect it in the range space to the notion of orthogonality in the range space y so that is the question how do you relate operator orthogonality to orthogonality in the range space All right. I'll move to the next slide. So let us now take one now special situation. Take x and y both to be finite-dimensional Hilbert spaces. So let us take uh, two operators t and s belonging to L of H. So this is like also taking matrices. We are looking at uh, finite-dimensional spaces. So this is also plenty of uh, implications in matrix analysis. So you take up T and S belonging to L of H. So since T is a finite-dimensional space, T is a an operator T is automatically a bounded linear linear operator is automatically a bounded linear map. And uh, a simple application of uh, Heinberg theorem will tell you that it actually attains its norm. In other words, there is a vector unit vector of length one such that norm of T of X naught is equal to norm of T. so that always happens 
So now let's make an assumption. Now suppose the real vector t of x naught is orthogonal to I have taken two operators t and s. So s image at this point x naught. So that is my assumption. T a times x naught at a point of length one is given to me by the very fact that we are in a finite dimension situation. But now I am making this uh, additional assumption to link t to s via the point x naught to say that uh, t of x naught is orthogonal to s of x naught. All right. Now let's take a scalar lambda and uh, look at the uh, norm of uh, lambda plus t of s. Since we are looking at operators, the usual inequality x naught is a unit vector. So the usual operator inequality tells you that this is bigger than or equal to norm of t of x naught plus lambda times s of x naught. So I applied x naught over here and noted that x naught is a unit vector. But now I use my additional assumption that t of x naught is weak of James orthogonal to s of x naught. So this thing is bigger than or equal to norm of t of x naught. But I am assuming that t attains its norm at this point, so this guy is norm of t. So you automatically have that the norm of t plus lambda s is bigger than or equal to norm of t, so that t is in the Bitcoin James orthogonal sense in the space of operators, t is orthogonal to s. Notice that in this entire analysis, I have not used a tactics in inner product space at all. What all I needed was that there is a vector of length 1 such that norm of t of x naught is equal to norm of t and t of x naught is big of James orthogonal to s of x naught. Then I got t to be big of James orthogonal to s. So that whenever the thing in the square rectangular bracket holds, the one in the elliptic brackets automatically holds. So this is it. You, when you do things, you suddenly realize very little of your hypothesis, special hypothesis, is needed at all. I, will, I did not need the Hilbert spaces, nor do I need finite dimensionality only to say that the norm is attained always. And then, of course, I make this additional assumption, and lo and behold, I can actually talk about the corresponding, if you like, in finite dimension spaces, matrices being orthogonal to each other in the big object sense. So an interesting question in the operator theory is does the, does the criteria in the previous slide determine orthogonality? So Bhatia and Samra's uh, major achievement is that they gave a positive answer in fact more than 20 years ago for finite dimensional Hilbert spaces that uh, if you know that you have a operators T and S and if you know that uh, uh, T is a pick of James orthogonal to S, then there is a vector X naught such that uh, T attains its norm at that point X naught and T of X naught is orthogonal to S of X naught in that for silver space sense. In other words, um, it is also known that uh, even in the finite dimensional bonnet spaces, Orthogonality of operators, if you replace silver spaces by bonnet spaces, orthogonality even in finite dimensions need not be determined by pointwise methods. Orthogonality of operators need not depend on the value set of specific uh, points of the, the operators concerned. This question and uh, variations on it have attracted uh, a lot of attention since the two decades since the paper of uh, but yeah, it's umbrella has appeared. And for me, a very satisfying aspect is that a large number of very talented Indian colleagues have produced some uh, stunningly nice answers to some of these problems. So there is a nice survey article, which I'll show you at the end, written by uh, Kanwal Paul and uh, Dev Maya Sale, which has a lot of uh, contributions by their group and other uh, to this uh, direction. This uh, direction has been very active. 
that surprisingly is uh, inexhaustible. There seems to be innumerable and durable problems that one can do in this area. So that is uh, one of my reasons to give a colloquial talk on this, namely because you don't want to get into something where it is quite hard to find problems, but uh, this seems to be one of the nice areas where it is uh, easy to formulate uh, interesting questions and uh, try and uh, solve them. So what we want to do is to understand how orthogonality is related to among operators to pointwise orthogonality in the dream space. That is what uh, Bhatia Samuel theorem would say. So like in the Bhatia Samuel theorem, we want the operator to attain its norm. Right? But we are no longer in finite dimensional situations and we are no longer in Hilbert spaces. When we are in infinite dimensional domain, this need not always happen. In fact, this need not happen even if you take something nice like a compact operator. So I'm not going to define compact operators. I expect that uh, your first course in functional analysis has uh, covered them. But um, from a little bit of experience, we know that if you take a compact operator T, so T is an operator between X and Y, so the adjoint T star, so here is one of space adjoint. Remember, we are no longer in the Hilbert space setup. We are working these problems in Banach space theory. So the Banach space adjoint T star takes you from Y star to X star, and um, it always attains its norm on the unit wall. So this is a nice uh, property possessed by compact operators, and it's not uh, difficult to show. So what we would do is uh, to compromise a little bit and say that, okay, of course you have to go to the dual. So what I would do is that I would take the domain X itself, a reflexive space, then the same argument as uh, I am saying here would say that if I now take a compact operator, it will always attain its norm on the unit. So that is how we will make the basic assumption. We will take our domain to be a reflexive space and P to be a compact operator so that non-attaining part of it is already guaranteed to me. So now uh, let me formulate this uh, general version of uh, Bhatia and uh, Samuel theorem that I propose to do. And uh, this I think has been uh, say, nearly close to 13 minutes since we started. Uh, is there any difficulty in either following or uh, internet wise? No, not at all. Very nice. Okay. Good, so let's keep going. So I want to formulate uh, this problem. So as I said, I will uh, stick my domain to a reflexive space. And uh, in the range space, I take a closed subspace Z contained in Y. And I take a compact operator T from X to Y. And let's assume we know that it will be attained. So let's assume that uh, the norm is attained at the point x naught, which is a unit vector. And let's also normalize the operator t, if you like, and take naught t to be equal to 1. Now, here is my assumption, similar to what Bhatia's general theorem says. Now, I want to assume that for all z in my subspace of y, t of x naught is orthogonal to z in the sense of Pickoff and James. All right. So there in Bhatia Samuel theorem, you have two operators and you want a T of X naught to be orthogonal to S of X naught. Where now I remove the operator by a closed subspace Z of Y and I now look at uh, vectors in Z and I want my T of X naught to be orthogonal to all the vectors in Z. 
Okay, let us see what happens when I make such an assumption. Now take any bounded operator between x and z. Z is a subspace of y. So look at all bound, any bounded operator between x and z. Or let us look at what for any scalar lambda, what is norm of t plus lambda s is. Again, by operator inequality, since x naught is a unit vector, this is bigger than or equal to norm of t of x naught plus lambda of s of x naught. But s is an operator which is valued in z. So s of x naught is an element of the subspace z. My assumption is that t of x naught is orthogonal to all vectors in z. So in particular to s of x naught. So this means this is bigger than or equal to norm of t of x naught. But that I use in even norm of t. So what have we proved? We have proved that t is orthogonal to all the operators from x to z. So this is the, my general analog of the Bhatia general initiative. Instead of taking two operators, I take a closed subspace. I look at the space of all operators between x and z, and I want to know when would I determine operators t, which are orthogonal to all the operators here. So that is uh, explains my title because I am not interested in two operator orthogonality, but some of operators which are orthogonal to a class of operators. So that's what I should do. Okay, so this is what we want to determine. If you know that this happens, like in the Bhatia Chamberlain theorem, one way is very easy. If you have all these nice things happening to you, then of course T is orthogonal. My thing is solve the converse problem. So what does the converse problem mean? I have an operator T now, which is orthogonal to all the operators from X to Z. My question is, can I get a vector X naught such that T attains its norm at that point and T of X naught is orthogonal to all the vectors in Z. So this is again, for me, is like looking at global information my information is globally between operators and what I want to get is really to get local information to say that then T of X naught is orthogonal to Z for all Z. So when I put it in this way, for those of you who have a little bit of experience, immediately see that what I am trying to solve is really an optimization problem. So that is the optimization mode. Maybe it should, uh, my font is small, maybe it will go to full screen. I think it's fine. No, it's fine, good. <laughs> All right, <laughs> because I, I'm a little bit uh, amused when I go to full screen. All right, Monica, thanks, bye. So, let us now uh, reformulate this thing in uh, the optimization setup. So one way of realizing, which is quite easy, I will again leave it to you as an exercise, to say that x is orthogonal to y in the sense of Birkhoff and James is same as saying when you look at the distance between x and span of y, that is exactly equal to norm of x. In other words, the distance is attained and attained at zero. The distance, the infimum is attained and is attained at zero. That's what orthogonality means. So that is the intimate uh, relationship between the optimization problem. So now let's go back to our setup. Take any uh, subspace, uh, closed subspace Z containing Y and look at the uh, distance between uh, T and X naught. So I'll assume that we have a vector X naught, which is of length one in the unit form. So let us look at distance between t of x naught and z. And the assumption that the t of x naught then is orthogonal to all vectors in z translates to saying that distance between t of x naught and z is exactly equal to norm of t of x naught. Remember that z is a subspace, so zero belongs to z. So this infimum is of course always less than or equal to norm of t of x naught. But what we are saying is that this input is exactly equal to norm of t of x naught. So that is the 
interpretation in terms of optimization of this requirement. The other thing is I'm saying that T should attain its norm at X naught. That was my other assumption to get this good collection. So that means what? This must be equal to supremum of X running over the unit ball norm of T of X. So this is a supremum. And this is of course distance. That means this is infimum. Right? So what we are really looking at is really an insub problem or a minimax problem. Now let us finally um, also interpret what it means to say my operator T is Pirkovsky's orthogonal to the entire space L of xz. That again means that distance between T and L of xz is equal to norm of T. So this is this optimization, this is this, and this is this. So we look at a general minimax problem where there are two optimizations. This is what you want to do. And you want T also to attain its norm. So you want to do two optimizations simultaneously. So the entire problem is reduces to a problem in the optimization theory. And again, people in optimization theory have been looking at problems where they not only settle one minimax problem, but they have a collection of minimax problems and they would try to get uh, simultaneous solutions to these things. But my approach, of course, is uh, from geometry of Banach spaces and I bring in uh, uh, my strength in the geometry to solve this uh, problem. All right. So let us look at uh, the map phi. So let pi denote uh, the generic quotient map. This means from the whole space to the quotient space. That's my generic map. So let the capital P be defined from the quotient space L of x, y, by L of x, z, to the quotient space. I mean, suppose this is a tank mistake. The stroke should be like this. Into the quotient space, into the space of all operators, from x to taking values in y over z. So how is it defined? So you take a, an equivalence class, so that is like a pi of t, pi is my quotient map here. Then I send it to the quotient map from x from y to y over z and compose it with t. So t is from x to y, pi is from y to y over z. So the composite map now will take me from x to y over z. So that is my quotient. There is a little bit of well-definedness here, but you can easily check that uh, this is a well-defined map. Since everything under consideration is linear, routinely capital P is a linear map. You can actually check that it's a one-to-one -one map. And uh, I will leave it for you as a simple exercise to say that it's a contraction. And of course, if I start with a compact operator here, then the composition is actually a compact operator. Because composition with a bounded operator is a compact operator, so it's a compact operator. So it maps compact operators to compact operators. All right. So this is the thing that I'm interested in. And uh, one of the most uh, fascinating problems in uh, operator theory is to know that uh, when is this map? Onto. So since uh, Monica is here, I must mention that uh, Fernanda, Monica, and uh, Richard Fleming have made a really substantial progress on um, solving uh, problems of uh, this kind recently. And uh, this is uh, again one of the connections between this work and uh, their work. Uh, the reason for me this is uh, very fascinating since again uh, there are a large number of students. I can't uh, but mention this uh, general fascination in mathematics is that uh, in mathematics uh, when you do operations on a system which are natural to the system, you want to know whether you are still within the same system or do you go out of that thing. So here is a very nice question. Taking quotients is a very nice Banach space theory property. So I look at L of x, y, and I look at this particular subspace, L of x, z, 
and I take the quotient of it. Question is, will it be again a space of operators? And guess is that should it probably look like operators from x to y over z? So that by performing this canonical Banach space theory operation in spaces of operators, we again landed with a space of operators. So this is a, one of the prime motivation for solving some of these problems. Now, now we want to know that uh, a certain procedure that you commonly adopt in Banach space theory actually leaves you within the same structure. It does not take you outside the system of operators. So that is the motivation. So that is called uh, the lifting problem. So what we need to do first is to make P an isometry. I don't know how to do this in general, of course, because as I said, this is enormously interesting problem. You just want to know that when you do this simple thing like quotienting among the classes of operators, when are you getting into class of operators? So, but in literature, one has, of course, uh, this is, of course, surely necessarily then an ancient problem. So, in the literature, there are uh, a large base of Banach spaces of Y and Z, such that uh, for selective domains X and operators T, you can actually find the S from X to Y, such that uh, when you compose it, uh, that map capital P from the previous slide is a subject, is an onto map. And uh, the, this is called uh, the lifting uh, problem. And when this uh, happens, then there is something very beautiful automatically happens, so in a non preserving way. Because it's essential that uh, the norm of the operator and the norm of the lift are the same. So when this happens, it automatically turns out that uh, it will be an isometry. The reason is that uh, if you have an uh, injective map, which is also a subjection and maps the unit ball onto the unit ball, then it will automatically be an isometry map. So that P becomes an isometry. And then again, for people who work in isometries, this is again an enormously fascinating question, namely to determine all isometries are of this kind. So that's, I will not go into that. But. So of course, if Y is a Hilbert space, this always happens, of course. For any Y and Z, this phi is automatically onto. But lifting is very easy to see, because you can compose it with the orthogonal projection whose range is onto the usual Hilbert space uh, orthogonal of uh, the subspace Z. So, in other words, we are attempting something which at least when you go back to Hilbert spaces is a doable problem. But I want to, of course, uh, do it uh, in the general Banach space theory context because somehow it's always uh, fascinating to take the bull by the horn. So, this is uh, one of the approaches uh, is again very classical, goes back to and uh, some of the best notes in the uh, analysis geometry of Banach space theory, and uh, Choi and uh, Efros. They, would, uh, they have given uh, examples of pairs where uh, uh, this can be done, and I'm not going to somehow uh, define all the notions uh, that are uh, involved here, but uh, they are popular notions, and in fact, probably Sudesh, uh, uh, unhappy student in their talks would be talking about these things. So this notwise the notion of an MIDL, which is again due to Alfson and Efros, one of the most uh, uh, outstanding works in geometry, uh, published in 1970. And uh, I mean, I still derive my influence uh, from this uh, seminal work of Alfson and Efros. And so that um, it happens, uh, so this is anyway definition of an MIDL. And uh, they have proved that uh, uh, when such things happen, and there is a good reference for these things, there is a monograph by Hormand, Werner, and Werner called uh, MIDLs in the Bana spaces and uh, Bana algebras. And uh, I don't know, I think uh, this little bit should also be interesting. This is because uh, this kind of a thing is uh, kind of a used to be, or maybe continues to be, a mecca at uh, Fry University of Berlin. And uh, my colleagues, uh, Dirk Werner, and uh, probably retired now, but they are her parents at uh, Fry University are uh, uh, one of the people who have enlarged these circle of ideas.
Okay, so if you assume, for example, uh, that domain is uh, uh, a separable space, then this uh, Andrew Choi and uh, Kefra's theorem would say that uh, if uh, Z is an M ideal and uh, the Banach space Y uh, uh, of the Banach space Y, and uh, Z also has this additional property that its dual can be identified with uh, uh, this space of all integrable functions with respect to a positive measure, then the operator T you are looking at always has a non preserving Lay. So that, that in, in this setup, the minimax formula is valid. And of course, we already know that phi is an isometry now. So phi maps compact operators into the space of all compact operators from, uh, from uh, x to y over z, because this is a composition. And um, now, what I want to do is uh, to go back, uh, uh, go to the next slide. So what happens is that uh, now I go to the space of our compact operators from x into y over z. And uh, what I need to do is somehow use the fact that the norm of an operator is attained at uh, an extreme point of uh, the unit ball of the space dual space. So that is a, a simple application of uh, cran Hellman theorem and uh, the Hahnemann theorem so that uh, if I have a transformation T, then let us say if I have a transformation in this space operators, then its extreme, its norm is actually attained at an extreme point of uh, the dual unit ball. And of course, that uh, does not completely solve you because you want to know then how will extreme points look like. And uh, that, seems, that is actually not a difficult thing to describe extreme points of uh, the unit ball of uh, the dual of the space of operators. It's actually a real representation theorem. I don't think I have time to do this, but uh, it's uh, just a real representation theorem. It will always look like uh, what I denote as a simple tensor x tensor y star. So this is an operator whose value at any r is. Well, r is between x and y over z. So r star will take you from the dual of this space to dual of this space. So that y over z star by Hahn-Banach theorem is z term. So r star is, now you take r star of y star. So r star is from uh, y z term, which is contained in y star. So you look at R star of Y star, that will take you to X star, and of course X is an element of X, so you, you evaluate it at this. So that is R star of Y star at X. So this is uh, that uh, extreme point that you have talked about. Okay. So now let's look at uh, our uh, distance equations. So look at the uh, distance between uh, T and L of XZ, that, since this is an isometry, is really the same as uh, the norm in the quotient, uh, the norm in the right hand side space. But the norm in the right hand space is attained at an extreme point lambda by application of von Banach and Cran Milman theorems. But then this extreme point can be described, so it will look like this. This is y star of Tfx. All right. Now, that is the usual inequality using the, the quotient maps. So y star of tfx, of course, is less than or equal to distance between tfx and z, because uh, we are looking at y over z both. So that, of course, is less than or equal to the quotient norm, distance between tfx and z, which, of course, is always less than or equal to norm of tfx. So that by the minimax formula that we have already had, we now know that distance between t from x to z is actually attained is equal to norm of t. t attains its norm at this particular point x, and this last equation would show you that uh, t of x is actually orthogonal to z. Okay. So now um, I think um, I have about uh, 20 minutes. So what I would like to do is at this stage uh, show you the references from my paper and uh, then uh, come back to this file. I'm sorry, I said uh, 10 minutes, I hope. Uh, 
Okay, so this is the paper. So this is the, the main theorem that uh, I have tried to explain it to you today. X I fix it as a separable reflexive monarch space because I know that uh, you know that for uh, T to attain its uh, norm, I need a reflexivity for a compact operator. So I assume that X is a separable reflexive monarch space. I think a Z contained in Y satisfying the hypothesis of, uh, for example, uh, and or join across theorem, but this can be replaced by any pay where the, the map capital phi is a subjective isometry. This is one example where this happened, so I merely stated it to that, but uh, it really works fairly generally. Then uh, let uh, t belong to kfxy, then the distance between t and lfxz is actually attained for some x naught t attains its norm at a point x0. In fact, it becomes an extreme point of the unit form and distance between t of x0 is equal to z and which is also same as uh, the operator norm in the quotient space, namely supremo of the unit ball of distance between t of, t of x comma z. So that this minimax problem can be completely solved in such a way that uh, uh, when you have a uh, T, which is uh, orthogonal to the space of all uh, operators from x to z, there is a vector x0 such that t attains its uh, norm at that point x0 and t of x0 is uh, orthogonal to z. And um, if you recall my uh, introduction about uh, the Bhatia seminal theorem, there I was only saying that there is a unit vector where the norm is attained. And of course, we are talking about Hilbert spaces. And in Hilbert spaces, unit vectors are precisely extreme points of the unit ball. So somehow, when you solve this minimax problem, extremality is automatically built into it. There is an extreme point x0. I'm not just saying that there is a unit vector where the minimax problem is solved, but it automatically gives me an extreme point where the minimax problem is solved. So you somehow want to uh, ensure that uh, whenever you prove an analog, all the elements of your original setup are captured. So you realize that unit vectors in the case of a Hilbert space are extreme points. And so the corresponding talk about Banach spaces must necessarily involve an extreme point where the norm is attained and things would happen here. So let's go back to references and uh, them briefly. So this is, uh, of course, what uh, started it all to several of us, but yeah, several. This is in linear algebra and its applications and uh, published in uh, 1999. Okay. And then, of course, there has been a spurt of interest immediately of uh, uh, people working in matrix theory like uh, C.K. Lee, Schneider, and uh, Soranio, and Bennett. They have published papers on orthogonality of matrices, uh, two papers again in linear algebra and its applications. And uh, then, of course, uh, uh, a group of our uh, friends uh, from Jagalpur uh, University, also at uh, Sivanandar University, they have all been working uh, rather furiously on these uh, uh, kind of problems and produced some. Uh, really remarkable uh, results which uh, bring out the interplay between um, geometry of normal spaces and uh, uh, this kind of uh, objects of diagonality. And there's a very beautiful uh, survey article uh, written by uh, uh, Kalman Paul and uh, Dirmanya Singh, which appeared in this uh, uh, advanced topics in mathematical analysis. So anybody who wants to work on these things, this would probably be a very nice uh, point. These ideas, of course, go back to really uh, light and shine, which uh, again there in their monograph called uh, approximation theory in uh, tensor products of uh, Banach spaces. And uh, it's a little bit of an you know, imagination. Tensor product spaces are also spaces of operators. So this is where you should uh, begin your quest.
And for me, of course, uh, the classical book, uh, Isometric Theories of Classical Normal Spaces by Lacey would uh, uh, bring out this. Of course, 7 is uh, a standard reference at, uh, about uh, M ideals and uh, their impact. And uh, then, of course, Ryan's book uh, on uh, tensor products of Banach spaces, again, is also a good source. And um, there is uh, somehow, uh, later on, you would see in my paper, that there is some uh, connection between the thing where I have occurred as a smooth, that means differentiability of the norm. So uh, there is work of Stefan Heinrich. I have also done some work uh, on very smooth points, and that has some uh, bearing uh, on all uh, these things. So that would um, explain uh, some of the references uh, involved here. And I think I have just uh, five minutes uh, left. So what I would uh, like to do at this stage is uh, to take uh, questions. Thank you for your attention. Okay, so let us uh, thank um, <laughs> Professor TSS Arkarao. Wonderful talk, TSS. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And I, I already see that Ajit Ji has raised her hand for a question. So Ajit Ji, go ahead. Yeah, please. Yeah. No, great talk. That is really very interesting. And the idea yeah, for yeah, yeah. in uh, Banach spaces and operator spaces, all done very well by Professor Rao. And there are many problems as he has told. And uh, he has offered to interact and that is a great opportunity. Thank you very much. Oh, very nice of all of you to attend, particularly the senior colleagues. I'm sure this must be a repetitive idea. But uh, every time I see it, uh, try to inject a new thing into the system. So I hope this is not too boring. This is really fascinating. And as Ajit Ji said, uh, TSS, I mean, it. there can be so many questions asked. And, and that's really fascinating. I mean. The, and, way, and the way you handle this situation, like in Hil when we have the bounded operators on Hilbert space, that itself, I mean, looking at that space and that's not a Hilbert space. So it makes sense to look at orthogonality for spaces. That's, that's, yeah, 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 that's, that's something which I really like. Any other questions, anyone? Okay, if not, let's thank the speaker again. Thank you, TSS. As I said, wonderful. Thank you. So I think we are done on time. So <laughs> right, you are yeah. absolutely on time. Yeah. And yeah. make some of the announcements. Uh, so let me just say something before Stefan makes the announcements. Two weeks from now, we are having Malavika Pramanik. For uh, she's giving a talk, and the title itself is extremely interesting. So this is the title she has sent me. So you think you can solve x plus y equal to two z? So that's the title of her talk. Please, everybody do attend. Some of you have already seen her speak at SCB Memorial Lecture at ISI, and you know how fascinating she is. And she's such a kind person, being so busy, but she still agreed to give a colloquium at our department. So please, everybody join us. This is two weeks from now, 8th October, and the time is different because she is in Vancouver, you know, in uh, Canada. So, so the time is 8.30 p.m. Indian time. So that's going to be 8 a.m. for her. So she, she, she's doing a big favor. She's getting up early. And so 8.30 p.m., 8th October is her talk. And now over to you, so Stephanie. Let me just say something uh, traditional. Yeah. Which I can't probably say in the colloquium of Malavika, but uh, she was uh, our master's student at the uh, Bangalore Center. So I taught her uh, in her uh, master's wow. mathematics. Yeah, you know, yeah. I also so remember when... Right, 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 right. right. I know, I know. I mean, when she was a master's student first year, she was in ISI Calcutta. And I remember in the stat map, all the professors were always saying, oh my God, she's a genius. She's a genius. So I still so remember. She that. Second year to Bangalore. Yeah, I during her, uh, so I'm sure you'll be, you'll, you'll sure. be there. I, I, I hope you'll be there. <laughs> so everybody feels so excited from ISI when, she, when we look at her, I mean, what she has done. So, so yeah, you are her professor and she really acknowledges just the training that she got from ISI. She always mentions that. Anyway, so we will... Nothing can be more satisfying for a teacher, right? <laughs> right, right, right. And teaching students like that, absolutely. So now I over to Stefan for other announcements. <laughs> 
Hello. Yeah, uh, basically, I have no announcement now. I will send out the announcement for next week okay. uh, during the next days. Okay, thank you, yeah, Stefan. Thank you very much. Nice talk. So nice thanks to everyone and we will we hope to see you back next Friday. We have a talk, usual time, but next to next Friday, 8th October, 8.30 p.m. Malabika Pramonik. Okay, so see you all. Thank you for Good coming. Bye -bye. Thank you, TSS, Good night. again. Bye bye. Good night. Good, Good, Good night to Good everyone. Night. Good night. Bye bye. Bye.